Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events is a set of 13 books, each containing 13 chapters, except for the last book, titled The End, that has an epilogue in the form of chapter 14. The hardback editions published by Egmont in the UK between 1999 and 2006 are wonderfully illustrated by Brett Helquist. Here follows my very foolish denouement. Denouement is a word that means the summary of a story in which the plot elements are explained or resolved. And in this case, very foolish, because if you have read the books yourself, you will know that such a thing is not really possible to do. So I am in fact using the word denouement to mean review in a witty tongue in cheek type of way. If you're not interested in reviews, I suggest you go and watch another one of my videos about book hauls from charity shops or car boot sales, where you will find the finding of these books among others. If you're not interested in books at all, then you could go and watch the Netflix show based on the books or the old Paramount film instead, or and this is probably the best and more preferable idea, go and do something else entirely different. Still here? OK then, let us begin at the bad beginning. It all starts on Briny Beach with the three Baudelaire children being told that their parents have died in a terrible fire that has also destroyed their home and all their possessions. The family bank manager, Mr Poe, who interestingly has two children, Edgar and Alan, and possibly a love of ravens, becomes responsible for finding the Baudelaire's somewhere to live until the eldest child comes of age and inherits the family fortune. There follows the series of unfortunate events, as if the initial one, the fire, wasn't enough. If you have ever lost someone very important to you, then you already know how it feels, and if you haven't, you cannot possibly imagine it. The setting is one of Victorian fairy tale dystopia, a gothic steampunk world with horses and carriages alongside automobiles, butlers and credit cards, wealthy children who don't go to school or behave in a very modern way. This allows for some visually fantastic dioramas as a backdrop to the absurd various family disasters. The books contain some very funny dialogue, apparently written by Lemony Snicket, who is himself a character in the book, trying to uncover the full story. He is a non de plume of Daniel Handler, who has written a further six books in his own name. I really liked the style of writing where he breaks the fourth wall to explain a difficult world in terms of the current fictional situation. These books are aimed at 8 to 14 year olds. That's not to say that adults won't enjoy them though and they encourage enlarging your vocabulary. Indeed, the books encourage reading on the whole, as all of the characters that are into books are portrayed as clever, intelligent and good, whereas all the ignorant bad guys hate books. Although it has to be said, the lifespan of the good ones tends to be limited, so I'm not sure it's really a great message. The narrator, Lemony Snicket, also continually implores you not to read the books and often goes off on a tangent about various fabulous diversions. In the first few books, the pattern of the story is very similar. The children go to a new guardian, the evil guy who is after their fortune shows up in a silly disguise that only the children can see through, the lovely guardian comes to a sudden demise or turns out to be totally useless, or both, and the children use their various talents to escape. The eldest child, Violet, about 14, is an inventor and you know she's about to invent something ingenious when she ties her hair up in a ribbon. The middle child, Klaus, about 12, is a researcher who loves books and libraries and has a great memory for everything he has read and he takes great notes and you know he's getting serious when he cleans his glasses. The third child, Sonny, is a baby or infant who has extremely sharp teeth and likes to bite things and has her own language. She develops the most throughout the books, learning to walk, learning to cook, and she also has the best dialogue, being a mix of baby talk and a clever play on words. Her siblings understand her perfectly, of course, and often translate for the adults. All three children are clearly intelligent and seem to have been raised in a loving family setting, taught to have an inquiring mind and to look out for each other. 
Actually, that seems to be one aspect of the books that is really far-fetched. They never argue or fight with each other at all. Anyway, in the first few books, each story is kind of resolved and shows that these kids are remarkably resilient. In the later books, the story becomes way more convoluted and morally grey. Gone are the black and white hero and villain tropes, and each book continues directly where the last one ended. Greater mysteries are explored, such as the organisation known as VFD. Who were their parents really? What is the sugar bowl for? And why are all the adults so rubbish? It's kind of like a parallel to a coming of age story. As the children get older, they begin to realise there's a whole world that exists outside of them that they have no influence on and that they might never fully understand. And that goes for the reader too. When you get to the end, the last book, and the end of the end, the final chapter, any hope of closure is vibrantly finally destroyed. Whilst some of the plot points are resolved, such as who Beatrice is, who the books are amusingly dedicated to, there are quite a few left hanging intentionally, not only to prove the point that not all books have to have a happy ending, although I would argue that strangely this one does, despite the warnings to the contrary throughout, but also to encourage the reader to make up their own mind about it all. And also as good preparation for reading long fantasy stories that may never be finished. There are many, many types of books in the world, which makes good sense because there are many, many types of people and everybody wants to read something different. The first book visits the trope of orphan children being left with an evil guardian, in this case Count Olaf, who is a distant relative genetically speaking, but the closest relative geographically speaking. He has a single large eyebrow and a tattoo of an eye on his ankle, which in later books is described as looking like a combination of the letters VFD, which is a recurring theme that develops more and more throughout the series. He just wants to get his hands on the Baudelaire fortune, but the way he tries to go about it is quite novel, if a little disturbing. The second book is called The Reptile Room. The three orphaned children are now sent to live with another single male relative, because that worked so well last time. However, this herpetologist uncle, a snake and reptile expert, turns out to be wonderful and soon has all the kids happily assisting him. Of course, as we're clearly told right from the start, there's no happy ending. It is a curious thing, the death of a loved one. We all know that our time in this world is limited and that eventually all of us will end up underneath some sheet never to wake up. And yet it is always a surprise when it happens to someone we know. It is like walking up the stairs to your bedroom in the dark and thinking there's one more stair than there is. Your foot falls down through the air and there is a sickly moment of dark surprise as you try to readjust the way you thought of things. There are two basic types of panicking, standing still and not saying a word, and leaping all over the place babbling anything that comes into your head. The third book was called The Wide Window. A female relative this time, but not for long. <laughs> if you are allergic to a thing, it is best not to put that thing in your mouth particularly if the thing is cats. There are few sights sadder than a ruined book. Book four was called The Miserable Mill. Again, the orphans are sent to a random, terrible place to suffer. This was even sillier than the previous books. Um, the children ending up at a lumber mill where they're forced to work. Book five is entitled The Austere Academy. Finally, the children end up at school, um, but this is a terrible balding school. Everybody will die, but very few people want to be reminded of that fact. If you are a student, you should always get a good night's sleep, unless you have come to the good part of your book, and then you should stay up all night and let your schoolwork fall by the wayside, a phrase which means flunk. Book six is entitled The Erzart's Elevator. The hapless orphans are back with another pair of relatives who seriously let them down. Did give a good lesson in not bothering to be in with the in crowd. And again, just when it seems they've found themselves in a loving home, they're let down badly. 
a good library will never be too neat or too dusty because somebody will always be in it, taking books off the shelves and staying up late reading them. Book 7, The Vile Village. Yet another madcap adventure in the lives of the Baudelaire orphans. This time, I really liked the supporting cast of characters and the way the orphans evolved. And I also liked the crows and ravens that featured in this book. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, and no matter how many people are chasing you, what you don't read is often as important as what you do read. It was after this one that the books became more serialised and less individual stories, because we saw the children escape from this village at the end of the book, and the next book carried on and showed you where they ended up, finding themselves at the hostile hospital. This one was very bizarre. I mean, I know all the books have been madcap and crazy, but this one seemed really crazy. When you read as many books as Klaus Baudelaire, you're going to learn a great deal of information that might not become useful for a long time. Book nine, The Carnivorous Carnival. This one was one of the strangest yet, but I did find it quite amusing and I did like some of the supporting characters. In this book, we finally got to see an illustration of the VFDI. One of the most troublesome things in life is that what you do or do not want has very little to do with what does or does not happen. Book 10, The Slippery Slope. This one picked up a bit for me. I liked the new character that was introduced and the setting in the story was a bit more grounded than the last two books and I became more invested again. Fate is like a strange, unpopular restaurant filled with odd waiters who bring you things you never asked for and don't always like. Book 11, The Grim Grotto. This one is set underwater, starting on a submarine and ending in an underwater grotto. But the children were really entertaining and likeable and they really carried the story. The ending did feel a little rushed. And again, it continues straight on in the next book, the penultimate peril was set in a hotel mainly and the three children are trying to prevent disaster. The setting was quite good. It brought together a lot of the characters from the previous books which, was in, which made it fun. Um, and I especially liked the section where the three children had to go off on their own and each had a chapter dedicated to what they were doing but they were all actually happening at the same time and how it all linked together. I did feel that the author was trying to introduce a moral greyness but it did feel quite forced and I wasn't sure that I was convinced by it to be honest. The woman who took me in said that one can remain alive long past the usual date of disintegration if one is unafraid of change insatiable in intellectual curiosity, interested in big things and happy in small ways. So at last we're at the final book, aptly titled The End.